so no questions. Okay, okay great. Okay. Hey, our, our next speaker is Carolyn Esch with uh, Esch Farms in uh, Monroe Township, New Jersey. And I have to say from personal experience, um, I've enjoyed the agritourism there. <laughs> I bought Cub Scouts there, so I'm going to say you do a nice job. Thank you. Thank okay. you so much. Appreciate yeah. it. Thanks. See it up right there. Thank you. I um, wanted to start off by saying thank you to Deborah and to Robin for letting me speak. I kind of approached them because I'm a past Danny Project graduate in 2011. And um, it was the very first time that I started seeing my business as a business when I completed this program. And I love the fact that when they asked you about your homework, there was complete silence in the room because we were exactly the same way. Nobody in our class had done their homework because it's just, it's overwhelming. But when you leave here and you actually start to put it together, um, I think you'll find um, the pieces will fall into place a little bit more. And uh, financially, those things can be overwhelming, but it's okay. It was exactly that way for my class of 2011 as well. So um, I wanted to do, I put together a quick little presentation. Um, I'll try to remember to look at the camera and look at you guys and try to do the whole thing together. But this is a picture of our farm. Um, a quick bio, I married a farmer. I was from Bergen County, um, knew nothing about farming at all. And um, so it was a, um, one my husband's a third generation farmer. So he, at that point he was farming um, hay and straw with his dad and they were doing field crops and so still are. Uh, we are, are now fourth generation. My son has gone through Delaware Valley University and come back to farm with us. So we're lucky enough to have still kept going and I'll talk a little bit about this later, but that's my definition of sustainability, right? Is that we're here to be able to give them some place to go. So um, I'm going to speak very, very quickly and pop through some of these slides. I'm leaving my business cards in the back of the room. For those of you out there in internet land, um, I'm on Facebook. Message me. You can email us as well. So you should be able to find us, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. So this is a picture of our farm. Um, we're currently doing uh, this a picture of corn. Our current corn planter, we're conventional farmers. Um, those are our hens. We have a traditional hen house. They um, do the little chicken thing, go back in at night. We close the door so they can sleep rest comfortably. And um, you know, for us, it's a little more labor intensive because we don't have a top on our hen area. Um, but they, uh, they're pretty happy, I think. They're pretty happy. They watch cow TV, as matter post. The cow watches chicken TV, and the chickens watch cow TV. So there you go. Um, we also have a retail hay and straw business six days a week. We sell out of one... 100 by 60 foot barn, so we have different kinds of hay in there all the time. And uh, it's a picture of my son on his first day of um, haying. And we have an agritourism business I started 14 years ago. I had some suburban friends who said to me, you're a corn farmer, you should be doing a corn maze. And I said, you have no idea what you're talking about. You can't just start a corn maze. And so, no, 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 we'll help you kind of thing. And it turned out to be a pretty good venture. Um, 14 years later, we're still using it as one of our sources of income. But for me, it was always one more value-added way to stay on the farm. It was never just what I was going to do. I mean, it defines me because it consumes so much of my mental energy and physical energy. But um, it's just one more way that we can stay on the farm, all the pieces put together to be able to stay where we are because it's expensive in Middlesex County. Um, this is our aerial view, urban sprawl, right there. So we are surrounded by 15 retirement villages in Monroe Township. Um, a lot of seniors, which means a lot of people who want to come and buy my eggs, right? So you can look at it two different ways. Um, we are really good neighbors. When someone comes up and has a question, we invite them to walk around the farm and meet our birds that they think are being not treated properly or whatever. They're, you know, um, a lot of people just don't have information. And as long as you are there to speak to them, um, that's really all they want. They just want their question answered and they want you to be nice. And so sometimes that's challenging when you have a lot on your plate and you're exhausted and the finances are just crappy, but you just have to be nice. And so that pays off in the long run. Um, all right, so we are conventional farming and I think that um, there's a real challenge in the world to feed everybody as we go along. Um, so I think that we need all different kinds of farming and there's a representative through this whole program, you've seen of different kinds of farming. So um, we are conventional corn farmers. So that means my feed corn is the thing that makes a Dorito, you know, so or corn syrup for a lollipop or a marshmallow. So until everybody's willing to not have those, you still need to have my kind of a corn. And so, but there are a lot of people that don't, that only want to, you know, grow, the only corn they want to buy is some corn grown from their local farmer because that's the corn they see. And that's wonderful. That's, that's, we need everything to do that, to be able to feed the world. We all have the same problems with water conservation, reforestation, honeybee health, and soil health. They're all just challenges. We all have the same things, even though we do different kinds of farming. 
Um, but there are a lot of experts, and that's the one thing that Annie's Project will give you is a pocket full of experts. So count on all of them and contact them. They're there to help you make sure that you can get where you want to go. This one little book I have a picture of was put out by Monsanto. I've had some really good experiences with the company that produces our conventional grain seed, um, giving me information and, and being able to um, mostly information about why my crop works for me. And so it's been a really good thing. But this particular book was put together about farming, uh, how the food gets from your farm to the plate. So um, I thought that was kind of interesting. I tried to get you guys copies, and if they come across, I will make sure that you get them. I asked them to see if they had 15 copies floating around someplace or 20, whatever. We'll see if they come across. But conventional farming um, really starts with plant breeding. Um, the corn on the left-hand side is what traditional corn would have been. And on the bottom right, you can see modern corn, how it's just through plant breeding you can innovate in order to help farmers grow vegetables with characteristics that consumers want while maintaining produce that's fresh from the farm to the fork. Tomatoes, for instance, there's two different classes of tomatoes. I don't know if anybody's even thought about them, but I know one woman on our uh, Farm Bureau Women's Leadership Committee only grows tomatoes for processing, and that's a specific kind of tomato. And so breeding has been able to enable people to generate that kind of a crop. And that there's, of course, that Jersey tomato that we all like to have. So. Um, there's different kinds of products that come out of plant breeding, and that was one of the ways that conventional, one of the tools conventional farmers have, as well as everyone else. Um, there are 10 GMO crops. I wanted to talk for a minute about GMOs. I don't know if anybody here has information about genetically modified organisms or crops, but there's a lot of misinformation out there. And I'm not going to spend the whole night trying to do this because it, I have, you know, a short amount of time. Um, but feel free to reach out to me about it or do your own research. Just try to find out what some of the crops are. 33 different kinds of corn, and six different kinds of potatoes, and soybeans, 20 different kinds of, of soybeans. But what things are, um, one, of the, the one of the sustainable solutions that we can access, um, let me see what slide number this is, seven, okay, good. Um, plant biologists identify a beneficial trait that helps a living thing thrive in nature, like an ability to use water efficiently, for instance. And that trait is then adapted to a new plant so it can better survive in its environment. So for people that are taking on an urban farming challenge, you want to be able to find the perfect, theoretically, plant or animal that's going to work best in your environment. And that's where breeding and, and genetically modified organisms may really play in your favor. Um, by growing GMO crops, farmers have larger harvests. And therefore, um, not only are my crops more sustainable, but my resources that I can use are less as well. Um, so my natural resources, I kind of put a, a, a thick slide in here. Um, but some corn crops can help protect harvests in water-limited conditions. Um, other GMOs can promote the practice of no-till farming, which we've been doing for many, many years. We haven't turned the soil over in a lot of our cornfields for quite a while. We have a nice, um, good percentage of topsoil. Um, and that helps keep the moisture and the nutrients in the soil. Um, no-till also means fields require fewer passes with machinery, uh, resulting in a reduction of fuel demands and greenhouse gases emitted. It helps fight disease and pests, um, and several crops have been modified to be resistant to insects. And typically, corn is one of the problems that we have had, for sure, that's been really successful with genetically modified items. So we can have um, corn that was resistant to corn borer, which will destroy my entire crop. So um, it's been a really successful trial. And you can see there were a lot of different corns that they used. Um, plants are modified with the traits that protect the roots from insect damage. And um, then, of course, conserving national natural habitats. GM seeds can help farmers around the world meet the existing demand um, and increasing demand to grow enough food by helping them make the most of their existing land and then um, enabling them to preserve nearby habitats. So that's quite a problem all over the world. Is, you know, I don't know that we're going to be able to feed everybody at all. So if we can use some genetically modified things, some local food, some organic practices, everything that works best, it's everything, in, if we're going to put them all together in our pocket and feed the world is our big thought. But it's a choice. Uh, nobody tells me I have to grow genetically modified food. Um, it, but by harnessing the new developments in, tailored in different situations, seed innovation focuses on growing enough on each acre, reducing the environmental impact of farming, and makes, lets me make a smarter decision. Um, in our efforts to truly shape agriculture to benefit farmers and consumers and the planet all together, we believe it's our responsibility to ensure innovations are made available to farmers large and small all over the world. And that's directly from that book that I saw from Farm to Plate from Monsanto. So that's kind of the theory behind genetically modified organisms. And again, you're there you can do hours and days and years of research on it. But um, just in a nutshell, I wanted to show you, show you some of that. 
So beware of greenwashers. I don't know if you even heard the term greenwashing, um, but greenwashers for an, uh, is someone who would put a spin on it, uh, on whatever they have, so that it looks better to the environment, or someone might be more proactive um, to buy their product or use their product because it's got a, a green or natural spin on it. So one example is ExxonMobil. So according to the Un Union of Concerned Scientists blog, which recently posted, no matter how much ExxonMobil talks about using oil to lubricate wind turbines, the company knows most of its oil and gas are being burnt by cars, by energy, gener ge energy generation, and by human, which is the primary cause of climate change. So you can spin anything the way you want to. You have to be careful of what you see and what you read. A recent Nielsen poll was conducted on a lot of consumers and determined that 66% of consumers are willing to pay more for sustainable goods. And that's why you're going to see companies turn to be a greenwashing kind of an ad, ad campaign. It's marketing and it's advertising. 73% when you consider millennials, actually, um, alone just for that. They're willing to pay more for something that's termed sustainable. So beware of that. Um, in September, I was invited to be part of a roundtable um, with 15 diverse voices to discuss the future of agriculture, in particular with sustainability. Um, there was a banker in the room, a dietitian, nutritionist, a doctor. Um, there were um, leaders of nonprofits that helped third world country farmers, businessmen and women there. Um, and each one of us has a different definition of what sustainability is. So I'm here to challenge you to make your own definition. To me, sustainability is that I still have a farm left at after 89 years to give to my fourth generation. That's not necessarily the definition of sustainability to a farmer in a third world country who's just starting. So everybody has intelligence. You're all here because you made a really, really smart choice to come and learn about being, becoming better businessmen and women. And so use your brains and make your own def definition of what sustainability is for you and then use the tools that everybody else is going to be giving you to be able to, to, to make your dream come true. Um, but sustainable, natural, um, research the claims and research the surveys that are behind the claims. A lot of times groups will quote like-minded uh, sources or even inter interquote themselves, the groups that are related. So make sure that your facts that you're looking at are true, what I would call scientific facts, independent facts before you say, yes, this is the, the, the one that I agree with. Um, okay, so that's just kind of, in a nutshell, what the greenwashing slide is, just in an effort to move forward. Um, but some of the problems that urban and what I call peri-urban, which is just right outside the city, and rural farmers share, we all share workforce issues. It's going to be quite challenging. It's challenging now. It's even only going to get worse, um, especially since minimum wage just went up. So there you go. Uh, financial security is for all of us. Everybody has those same problems. Consumer support from neighbors. Um, as you start your new ventures out to try to do something on a, on a piece of land that had a different use before, it may be really challenging to the neighbors right there. Everyone's afraid of change. A lot of humans are afraid of change. So you just know who you are, be sure of what you want, have a great business plan, have the money behind you, and just go forward with it. Um, because financially and emotionally, it's going to be challenging. But it's so worth it. Um, sustainability, again, that's, that's one of the things we just talked about. And the world needs all different types of farmers producing our food and fiber and fuel. And we're lucky enough, we're really, really lucky to be in America where we can make those choices. That is not the case for a lot of people all over the world. Um, so I just want to give you one quick story. We have, in terms of my consumer relationship, um, they build our farm. If you remember that first slide, you saw a picture of our farm. And it's at the top of the hill, geographically. Like, they, it used to be a mine, because the gravel underneath is perfect gravel for pitcher's mounds. So back in the 70s, when people could actually, the Monroe was, was, didn't have ordinances against mining, um, so some of the land was sold. And so it's, it was kind of a big pit. So it's a perfect place to put some retirement housing, especially with a big red hip roof barn on the top of it. So they build it as the farm on the top of the hill. Well, I had a gentleman come up to me, an older gentleman from the retirement village, just came, oh, is this the, can I see the owner? I said, yeah, that's fine, that's me. He said, well, I just have a kind of a question. I'm like, okay. He said, you know that, um, that stuff that's like around, around the corn cob? I said, the husk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, that stuff. So, so like, if that were to, like, kind of blow down the hill and, you know, like, wrap itself around my light and, like, catch fire, like, that wouldn't really be your responsibility, right? I'm like, that would be your homeowner's insurance. Like, you knew darn right well you bought a, a house below a farm 
that has, you know, we have refuse. I can't really control every single piece of refuse on my farm. You have to know what is going on. And so, you know, by me just saying, you know what, I, I hear you, it was difficult. He was scared, and he wanted to know what was going on. So he went, actually didn't really totally approve of my answer and went to the homeowners association. And what they decided was they're going to put up a fence. So they put up a four-foot, I guess the snow fence is about four foot high, the red and brown snow fence, right? So now when we harvest, because um, we only have eight acres there for the corn maze, so when we harvest, um, the combine is 15 freaking foot tall. <laughs> so the corn is going over the fence, <laughs> down the hill. So you know, everybody has a good solution, they think, until it's really not a good solution anymore. But we're, you know, we work with them. They said, can we come on your property? Can we please put the fence up? The people here are really concerned. They just need to have some peace of mind. Absolutely, come on our property, put the fence up. So, but what they really need to do is the day after harvest, they need to have their landscape guys come back with their lawnmower and just mow that little piece of land and just get the pieces off. So, you know, they didn't really ask for our solution. They just came up with their own, which is okay. The communication has started, and really that's what it comes down to. Um, okay, so women in New Jersey leading the way in terms of Annie's project. Um, Jess Niederer is a graduate of a 2011 class, Chickadee Creek Farms in your picture. Uh, Chris Goodadora is uh, a farmer uh, and red lead. She was executive director of Farmers Against Hunger for many, many years and now teaching um, and it's an educator, FFA educator. Jess Dreyer, we saw before some of the other pictures. The picture of the sheep and the, the barn quilt, that's Jane Brodickers up in Sussex County. They're also a um, very prominent farm family, and Jane's been leading the Women's Farmers, Farm Bureau Women's Leadership forever. And there's the 2012 graduates of Annie's Project. They made themselves some shirts. That's how I knew it was 2012. I don't know who the fourth person is, but those three people, uh, four people there were um, down in South Jersey as part of the program too, and they've all stepped up to the plate to become women leaders actually in agriculture groups. So the world is led by those who show up. So what I want to tell you is, this is it's a statement by Chris Chin. She's a Min Missouri Director of Agriculture. There are a lot of people that want to tell you what you can and can't do. You need to be the voice in the room. So this is just a, a quick list of, you'll find this all online as well, some of the organizations that exist in New Jersey um, for people to be able to a be active in. So find the one that's unique to the kind of farming that you're going to be doing and join it and be the person there that is going to tell your story. I just told you a consumer story. That's my real story, right? So it, it, that's what goes for me. Again, this is our agritourism story. Um, we kind of, you know, try to make it fun at the end of the day. Try to, you know, but my, I guess I have a bakery. There you go. And then um, there was one more slide, I guess. It was just to, to tell your story. So um, I've started to do that by um, journaling, and so some of that is really important to do. But you'll find in times of stress, um, even writing down your emotions from year to year are really good. And don't forget at the end of the year to do a synopsis of what just basically what worked. I kind of, in my mind, go around the corn maze and I say, okay, bakery, this is what worked, this was this change, this was not going to work. Because you have to write it down, you're not going to remember. As much as we're all intelligent, this, it's not going to happen. So um, just be sure to tell your story. And, um, you know, everybody's got your back. So we're all here. Thank you, Carolyn. If we have any questions, if 